Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science Show Technology. In today's show, Future Friday, we're going to talk about myths about renewables. So let's dive right into it. Now, before we break down the science of it, we have to understand where the heck these sort of myths are coming from. Well, there are, is an old world order, meaning before the tech became such a big deal and such an important part, there was the what we call black gold phase, meaning these old world order, basically these companies, these people has to have a lot of power, like seriously, ludicrously large amount of power and that's without firing any sort of single shot or firearms. That, that was the scary part, like they were that powerful. I mean, like they were affecting who was getting elected, what's happening, what sort of laws, policies, got tier level power. And again, they are doing everything in their power to retain that capacity. Again, it's slowly going away, uh, but like it's not gone to zero. But if they really keep uh, like, you know, losing at the current rate, they will let it everything go. So they are fighting tooth and nail to make sure uh, that that sort of power monopoly does not go away because here's the de decentralized energy is catching on. And they are seeing it. They are seeing just the hints of it and they're like, oh damn. Because being they are smart people, basically people working on those sort of company, they are smart. They know for a fact that if they do not adapt to it or uh, slow down the progress, they have two options, adapt to it or like, you know, fight it to slow it down. Fighting it is to slow it down is cheaper. So they are like, fight it to slow it down. Uh, they, they will be gone. They'll be like gone of the era. Like it's like back in the days, telegram operators were rich. Now they are not. So same thing. So how the heck this sort of myth takes hold? you have misapprehension. For example, uh, try to understand any complex technology, be it solar, be it wind, does require horsepower, does require this puppy. And that's a limited resource, meaning you do not have, like if you have a wife and child and a job and all that jazz, you have fundamentally spent most of the time. So in those sort of scenarios, you cannot be like, oh, I'm gonna like, you know, research this extra project and then I'm gonna study it, then I'm gonna uh, figure out all the nuances of it. That's not happening. So what you will have is a poor approximation of what real technology is. So misapprehension, that's the first layer. Second, you have half lies, meaning nobody is dumb enough they're gonna lie to you directly. No, 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 they're much smarter than that. What they're gonna do is have a lie and sprinkle in some truth that will allow you to get passed through your BS detector. So half lies. Then resistance to change. Now this is an aspect of human nature itself. That's why I said like you, all these companies, they can decide to change with it or fight it. But again, inherently we hate the idea of change. We, and it's all of us, you, me, every Tom, Dick and Harry. So that's like resistance to change. That gives us that final glue. And then we come to the uh, clever aspect that is outdated data, meaning the data that they are telling you is true. It's just that it was a true in 2000. It's not true today. So. You know, that's how this sort of myth becomes something undeniable, meaning no matter how much you educate, no matter how much you train, no matter how much you show it to, it to people, people will deny their own eyes. Meaning even if they are seeing with these two puppies, they're like, I don't believe it. Like that's the scary part of it. If myth have this many layers to it, it is un, what you call, uh, you can't dispel it, so to say, no matter what you do, you cannot, you have to live with it. That's the weird aspect of it. And then we come to uh, the salesman aspect of it, meaning the renewables kind of had an aura of magic to it, meaning people were had too much over expectation out of it. Again, it was also perpetuated by some scientists, they were like getting good carried away and all that jazz. So that created a expectation over a load. And that created a scenario where people were upset by it. So it pissed off people. That turbocharged the first layer of myth. So, for example, many people, even though their engineers uh, coming, uh, technician coming to install solar in their household, they would have told them clearly, sir, this is an on-grid solar array, meaning if the grid goes down, this will not work. This is a requirement of the law. We have to do it this way. The only way to bypass this is to have expensive battery unit. And they're like, no, 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 I don't need battery and all that just. But when the power cut did happen and broad daylight, their solar panel is not making money, they got angry, even though they were explained this thing. But how the heck that happened? misapprehension. It's very easy to understand, oh, it's a grid tie. It's like, sir, grid tie means you are tied to the grid, meaning the grid, there is no grid, you will not be able to produce power. So that created a lot of pissed off people. So that's why like, you know, oh, solar does not work, oh, it's just BS or this and that, like you waste money and all that, that happens from that vector. And again, the same goes with uh, early wind farms also. So all this creates a very, uh, what you call strong scenario where people are actually resistant to change. Because again, did not, Mark 1 did not work. Then we come to the uh, growing pain aspect of it. I, I, when I'm saying solar panels, back in the days, 100 watt solar panel was unheard of. Like the biggest panel you could buy was 50 watts. Now you can just go to a shop and it's like, here's a 500 watt solar panel. And there are bifurcated solar panel that works on the both side. Both of those puppies can easily go to 700 watts. Like that was unheard of. But again, imagine if you were trying to do like a, a large solar array on 50 watt panels, the amount of connectors you have to have, the amount of wiring you have to have, it would be so huge. You'll be like, bro, 
No. And that comes with the aspect of growing pain. Any technology on day one is useless. Do you remember how useless your uh, basically 1G phone was or 2G phone was? Like I am old enough where I used to use GPRS, Edge. I used to use those sort of technology. Those were laughing stock compared to what we have today. But again, that's the growing pain aspect of it, meaning we had to grow through this. If people did not invest on those, we would never have had 3G. If people were never invested on 3G, we will never have 4G. Same way with energy also. Like it's not gonna be like, oh, we started it, it works. Heck, original core power plants were barely 10% efficient. Now we are getting to a point where it's like 30, 40% efficient. That was never the case. So same, growing pain is also giving us a lot of resistance to change. So this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, very hard to break through. So let's understand the scientific aspect of it, like the tools that they are using, the half lies. So emission aspect of it, like they are polluting. Well, here's the deal. Let me be clear as day. Making things have emissions, no matter what you do. It does not matter the nuclear reactor, fusion reactor, or hulululu or jingalala, whatever the heck. If you are making things, there will always be emission. Now, let's come to the interesting fact. Emissions are not free. For example, let's say you are Boeing, um, let's say Airbus A380, you are a big ass plane. You're like, I have four big ass engines to buy. Now there are two companies that are selling your product. It's like Rolls-Royce and General Electric. General Electric is like, hey, our engines are cheaper. You're like, okay, millions of dollars we are talking about. So even a few percent cheaper is a like big deal. So you're like, okay, that's that's cool. And this company is like, hey, uh, our engines are expensive. Like You're like, okay, that's a done. No, 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 hey, our engines are expensive, but it's more efficient. What do you think an airline company will choose? And if you said they will choose more efficient one, yes. Now, do they give a damn about environment? No. They know this one simple thing. The more fuel they burn, the more emission that happens. That's how they will sell you. It's like, hey, we are choosing engine uh, because, you know, we want to save the environment. What they will tell to their shareholder is like, bro, less fuel means less expenditure. Emissions are not free. Meaning, oh, this container ship is so emitting so much. Again, that emission is not coming out of nowhere. That's coming from pocket. Somebody had to spend money for that invest. Like, it sounds odd, but we have to spend money for emissions. If your coal power plant is emitting a lot of gases and it's not extracting too much energy out of it, it's burning money away, literally. So again, uh, giant uh, marine diesel engines, they are very efficient. Why? They have to be. That emission is not coming out of like, oh, nowhere, no, no penalty. There is financial penalty to that. That's the core fundamental law of physics. Emissions are not free. Somebody has to pay for it. So, uh, if, let's say, apply a condition, if solar and wind had emissions that were higher than coal, nobody would build it. Again, we, we were building solar where it had that kind of sort of emissions. But then at that point in time, solar was only used for satellites. It made sense in that sort of context. People were using it. But if we are building solar farms, that fundamentally means we have crossed that threshold. Fundamentally means we have less emission from uh, basically solar panel. Otherwise, that emission had to be paid for, that energy cost had to be paid for. And if the panel has, let's say, potential of X of an amount of energy production, if it costs X amount of energy to make it, nobody will buy it. It's like, why I'm buying it? Again, in space, it kind of makes sense. On Earth, it does not. But if it's making sense on Earth, fundamentally means mathematics is saying it will make more energy than it will consume to make it. Otherwise, nobody will build it. So that's the law of physics. And Mark 1 of all products are always garbage. Be it first wind for, uh, turbines that started to become commercial or the first solar farms, all of them were garbage. And it's su supposed to be like that, supposed to be like that. But at this point in time, the current general, uh, general technology we have, it's last much longer, meaning back in the days, solar panel, you would be lucky if you also had a solar panel that had useful capacity after 10 years. Now we have solar panels that have warranty of 25 years. Again, the current generation technology, it's very efficient in terms of how long it lasts and not to mention the manufacturing cost also went down. Why? Uh, mass production. So all those things consider create a footprint. Like how, what is the carbon footprint? Under no circumstances, carbon footprint of any renewables is higher or even close to gas or coal. To give you a mathematical context, we use CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour. Basically, how much CO2 would be emitted per unit of electricity. So wind. That is 13 grams of CO2 was released for uh, that wind. Now you were like, why 13? Why not zero? Well, here's the The wind turbine will consume X amount of energy to make it. It's going to produce uh, X plus whatever percentage it is, or like X multiplied by how many percent. But it is going to have an end of life, meaning it's going to only work. Generally, it's said to be around 25 years of lifespan. And then they have to be decommissioned. So that creates a scenario that has a fixed carbon footprint. That carbon footprint divided by how much energy it creates gives you the uh, basically grams of CO2 released. That's 13 gram of CO2 per unit of, of electricity. That's negligible. Solar is a bit high, 43. 
again uh, not that bad but not that great compared to wind now wind is getting better and better simply because that we are figuring out we can make it huge very huge now what about coal one kilogram so if you are uh, trying to get one unit of electricity the average emission would be 921 grams per unit of electricity if you are burning natural gas natural gas will be also give you around uh, 404 grams now why the heck natural gas has so less well it's methane ch4 majority of energy is coming from hydrogen bonds rather than carbon bond thus it has less co2 emission that's why like europe was going all in we have to go to natural gas again it's a delayed reaction but it's not solving the problem it's just delaying it if you are getting hundreds of gigawatt out of coal it will have much more pollution in fact compared to getting hundreds of kilowatt um, gigawatts of power on natural gas so they were shifting to natural gas then we come to the solar very little then we'll come to uh, hydroelectricity very less even nuclear has this be mindful even nuclear reactors takes a lot of energy and be mindful nuclear is replacing the co2 with nuclear waste so it's not zero and compared to current to wind turbines no no just no solar again solar has some catching up to do but we are reaching that point so fundamentally speaking, wind, solar, flat out beat any fossil fuel at this point in time, current technology today. And again, these numbers, every time you will check it, the coal and gas will barely change because again, we are trying to uh, improve the steam system. And sometimes people are trying to remove the steam system, putting a supercritical CO2 system that should improve it, but don't expect too much out of it. But uh, wind and solar, we are reaching an exponential growth on that. Like 13 grams of CO2 emitted per unit of electricity. That's nothing. So, and it keeps getting better. This is another aspect. 13 gram is not today. Like back in the days, it was like uh, very bad. Like it was like 50 to 500 grams. That's how bad it was. Like at 500 gram, it's almost matching natural gas. That's the time where it was like, oh, it is emitting. Yeah, Mark 1 technology was that. Current? No. So, technology is getting better, better, time after time. And coal and gold is known fix. Coal and gas both have known quantity, meaning even if you have a coal mine, for example, in Jharkhand has a lot of coal mines, does not mean those mines have infinite capacity, meaning there is a cost to it. And the coal is getting more expensive. The deeper you have to go, the more expensive coal becomes. So coal prices are going up. Same goes with natural gas. Both of them have fixed costs and which is going upwards. While you have a uh, cost of renewables is going down. Fundamentally, we know of this for a fact, like uh, in 2000, uh, early 2000s, if you have given anyone 10 lakh rupees, hey, put solar farm on my rooftop, they would have like, laughed at you. It's like, bro, you will barely get few kilowatt, barely one kilowatt or two kilowatt. Do that today, you will have a solar farm that is so efficient, so powerful, we, even with battery bank that you will be like, bro, grid is there. Awesome. Grid is not there. I don't care. And you're going to be running air condition. I'm talking about India. So that's the whole fact. Solar is becoming cheaper. Wind is becoming cheaper. While coal and gas is going only more expensive. And it's a fact. It cannot be bypassed around. So that's why if anybody tells you, oh, it is emitting. Yeah, it's just negligible compared to what coal is doing or gas is doing. Then we come to the another fear factor aspect of it. Reliability. Now here's the deal. The grid that we have right now. It's not 100% reliable. Fundamentally, no grid nowhere on this planet is 100% reliable. I'm not talking about the consumer experience. I'm talking about the grid itself. It's not 100% because again, it has things. For example, downtime, it has faults, it has trips. All these things are normal. The reason we build grid is that it can absorb this sort of faults where it's like, oh, I got this. Like Pakistan happened national grid failure for one whole day. Again, that happened. It's a fact. It happened. Uh, Texas had like a polar vortex, which destroyed majority of uh, basically natural gas power production. And again, it trip, uh, crippled all the uh, grid. Basically, a giant section of grid was like offline. So it does happen. So saying like our grid is 100% reliable, these renewables will make it unreliable. That's not happening. And like the stupidity on uh, te Texas part was like mind boggling. They were sharing, oh, wind turbine froze up. It's like, and the photo they were showing was from Sweden. It's like, bro, what the hell? So that's you have to understand. So how the heck, if when I'm saying grid is not reliable, then why the heck we have electricity? Well, we have people, thank for that, uh, energy dispatchers, which call them. And these people work 24 into 7, meaning there are shift, three shift or four shift, and they're working 24 into 7 into 365, like years on end, they have to work. If they ever slip up, either national grid could go down or a small sector can go down. So fundamentally, these people are the one who are making sure this house of cards, this fragile equipment that we call grid does not go boom. They are making sure there is no such thing. Oh, oh, grid is reliable. No, grid is not reliable. There are people who are actively working. They are like steering it. It's like, okay, okay, overproduction, underproduction. Over. Okay, they are balancing it out day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. That's the sole reason we have a grid. So from their point of view, if you add like, we're going to add a solar to it. 
it does not make a difference. You're like, we're gonna add wind to it. It does not make that much of a difference from their point of view. And that's why we are uh, like, you know, adding solar farms and wind farms. That's why our grid did not collapse because of that. And be mindful, it is true that solar and wind are not 24 into 7. That is true, but they are predictable. And the more farms we started to build, uh, be it wind, specifically we wind, we became so good that wind farms can get uh, almost a week ahead of head warning. Whereas like, this is our projected output of this farm next week. And it's accurate to few megawatts. Like if you have a farm that is like multiple gigawatts, let's say two gigawatt or four gigawatt, they can give you a graph. Like this is the power output that we are expecting next week. And we are damn close to that graph. We're like, it's creepy how good we are. Like we are actually saying, this is how the speed of wind will be next week. And we are accurate. Like that's how good we became. And the more farms we add, the more so, uh, basically weather satellites we add, the more precise we are becoming. So instead of uh, back in the days, it was like 50% up and down. Now it's like, bro, we are saying we are only going to make you 200 megawatts. We are making 203 megawatts. That's how good we are. And I'm talking today, like today, right now. That's how grid dispatchers manages it because they have a graph mark where it's like they know for a fact that they do not have to spool up uh, basically natural gas generators because they know the wind will start to take up and wind started to come. They don't have to worry. Heck, majority of the time they have to shut down wind turbines because they overproduce. Not overproduce, I think like they're producing more power than rated. It's just like they have to curtail power. So from their point of view, it's like it's just a new vector that they have to deal with. And that's how nations are adding more power without collapsing it. No boom. No boom happened so far. To give you a context in Indian sense, India has added 40 gigawatt of capacity, basically oomph that we have is 40 gigawatt. And how much units of energy we got gained out of it? The, I'm talking about 2022. 68,000 gigawatt hour units. That's some big numbers. Like, and that's the tiny in terms of wind. Uh, European, they have like very large number in terms of wind. India, like wind, we are like kind of behind schedule, but we have solar. So solar daddy is 56 gigawatt. May not sound that big, but here's the deal. How much energy we gained in one year out of this is 73 terawatt hour. Now let me sink in. Terawatt hour, if you count whole nation's power consumption, that's only under 2000 terawatt hour. Solar has reached a point where it has same unit of a national level, meaning how much energy nations consumes? Terawatt hours. How much solar produced? Terawatt hours. Now you're like, okay, there is still a gap. It does not matter. Back in the days, this was like terawatt hour consumption. We had a kilowatt hour production. Then kilo became mega. Mega became giga. Giga became tera. And I'm talking all this happened after 2000, meaning solar technology that is changing this country is younger than I am. So the fact that it is on the same unit as national energy consumption should tell you like this is serious. This is here to stay. And fossil fuel plants are just helping us buffering it. For example, is it beneficial for India to just go YOLO on solar farm? Absolutely. All they will do is like, hey, all coal power plants shut down on day. Only in spool up at night because we know for a fact that the hey, sun won't be there in the night. So that's there. And natural gas power plants are acting as a peaker buffer system where they're like, we know like, and weather data is used for graphing outputs. And then we are like, uh, basically, uh, plant operators get a map. It's like, this is how much power we are expecting. And then we adjust it. So what does that mean for a nation? It simply means uh, basically you're reducing coal and gas consumption. Be mindful, coal is getting more expensive. Burning less of it, awesome. Gas is becoming expensive. Burning less of it, awesome. It saves money. That's why like doing this sort of solar and wind integration is desirable, even on a fossil fuel grid. You're just reducing their consumption. And share of total power, uh, basically back in the days, it was like 0.001% is from wind and solar. Now it is like bro, 20%. So it's growing and it's growing exponentially. Because be mindful, terawatt hour. Like I remember when this was like kilowatt hour. I remember when Wikipedia started to go to megawatt hour and it jumped from mega to giga to tera very quickly. It's like damn quickly. So that's the reliability aspect. So do not let anybody trick you. It's like, oh, solar and wind is not reliable. It, it does not matter. They are predictable and we have people whose sole job is to do this. They deal with this. That's why they are trained. That's why they are there. That's why they are paid. And again, we are not going to say like zero fossil fuel. We're going to say renewable as much as we add and less and less, less and less. Over time, we'll reach a point where we'll no longer need fossil fuel. It's going to happen slowly. It's going to be a more of a smooth transition rather than bam, no coal, no gas. That's not going to happen. Slow transition. Then we come to the political aspect of it. Now, people do not care about environment. You have to accept it. You have to live with it. However, every Tom, Dick and Harry cares about their freedom. For example, you can go to Nepal and be like, hey, uh, you should invest in this. They're like, I don't care. It will give us green environment. They're like, I don't care. The moment you say to them, hey, you don't have to be dependent on China or India for fuel, they're like, shut up and take my money. And that's why every country is doing this. That's why European Union is doing this. They, are, they do not want to pay someone else. Because be mindful, fuel prices looks like a 
you know one uh, step ahead of you like it does not matter to you but here's the deal food prices are directly tied to fuel prices meaning your farmers can be producing boat load of food no problem but here's the deal. how the heck they are producing they are running tractors they are running trucks to move those things around voila you reached a point where if your fuel prices are high even if your farmers are producing too much uh, you will still have high food prices and nobody likes that where is like oh my country is starving why oh fuel prices went up like pakistan or sri lanka you do not want that nobody wants that so it's in your national interest where they're like hey let's go for energy independence and again there are many small uh, like EU is a commission of multiple countries. Some countries have like very good energy uh, independence in terms of like they have so much independence and peak days they could be producing 150% of their national power from wind. They sell that 50% extra to other borrowing neighboring nations. So it's a very, very powerful thing to have that sort of immunity and that gives you global price freedom where it's like you don't care. It's like, oh, gas is becoming expensive. Oh, I don't care. Oh, this is becoming expensive. I don't care you reach that point and your food prices, your national security and stability becomes stable. That's awesome. And the whole reason European Union grow back some balls that it can stand against this is simply because of wind and solar. Back in the days when Putin started a nine year war with Chechnya, they could not do anything. Because they were like, what the hell are we gonna do? Same happened in 2014. Uh, basically when the uh, took Crimea. They could not do anything because they did not have the balls to do this. Like, if we do that, he can cut off gas and we're gonna starve. Uh, so they were like, what the hell are we gonna do? But they poured their money, their ass into solar and wind. And look at what we have here. The year 2022 is the first time where solar and wind produce more energy than natural gas and coal. That's huge. And you might like, why the heck coal went up? Well, reality was uh, at the early stages of the war. People were afraid that uh, Putin might cut off the gas. So they were like, all the coal power plant that dis dismantled, they started it back up again. So that's why like there is a surge in coal. But most of the time they were just cooling. They were just like acting as a in-case emergency reactor. They were like, they pressurize the steam, spin up the turbine, sink it with the grid, and they're just like waiting. It's like, and again, they were expecting to use those things if winter was brutal. Winter was not brutal of 2022. So that demand did not matter. That's why coal went up, but not too much. It was like an emergency buffer system. And wind and solar look from 2000 to 2022. It's slowly going up. It's like, I don't care. It's like slowly going up. And this gave European Union the confidence that if they pour more money into this, like this is a real world graph. This is real today kind of thing. It's like, if we pour their money, we build better interconnect system, we build better energy island, we can just yeed this individual out. It's like, out, bye. So that's why, like from a nation point of view, it's powerful to be like, hey, we have our own system. Now you're like, what if somebody booms this or that? It's like, again, that can be done to anything. So, and not to mention, they may not even need to do that if you are dependent on their oil and gas. So it matters. It was great year 2022 from energy point of view. So, <clears throat> And be mindful, uh, nuclear and hydro, because again, hydro is going down continuously around the planet because again, we no longer have glaciers. So what we have is flash flooding and dry drought that are brutal. So hydropower is going down and nuclear also. Why? Again, nuclear requires oh, guys, rivers to cool it. If you do not have river level water supply that is continuous and reliable, you have to shut down nuclear power plants, which happened to France. But be mindful, what was their like, overall? Wind and solar. I got this fam. So increase this puppy over time, the moment it crosses 30%, it's like, it's sorted. By the time it crosses 50%, it will be like, okay, phase out oil and gas. Again, this is today, like see from 2000 to that. That's why. And Vladimir Putin kind of acted like a very good teacher. He bitch slapped Europe and Europe realized, now we have to have energy independence today. That's a very big thing. And uh, basically people, uh, Oil and gas dependency is a brutal thing. Again, same thing happened with Pakistan. Same thing happened with Sri Lanka. Same thing started to happen to some level to India also. So we are all realizing that we have to shift to renewables for that reason. And renewable energy kills dictators because again, once you have renewable energy, you can actually, oh, you are increasing oil prices. We can fight you still. That's why uh, Europe is supporting Ukraine because they can afford to sustain it. Not 100%, they are not there yet, but that growth from 2014, we, we condemned this to like not even sanctions to 2022, it's like bro, too much, too much. So that's a very good thing from political point of view. Then we come to the, some hard facts. So fact is, renewable energy is, is not magic. We want it to be magic, but it's not magic. What it is, is what we classify as less bad option. For example, uh, if we have very giant uh, wind farms on sea, we could destroy some bird population. That is true. But here's the deal. If you don't, and if you keep using your fossil fuel, you risk literally cooking the whole planet alive. So those two things are non-comparable. 
so we are choosing less bad option basically we are choosing a basic technology compared to a lethal technology we are going from uh, 1g to 2g in future maybe we'll have something better maybe in 100 years from now we're gonna have fusion and we're gonna look back at this technology and laugh at it but that's not today so today we have to deal with what we have we don't have magic so we are dealing with it and many times we'll have, shouldn't we wait for like you know looking for magic history any of you who are old enough should know well enough that there is no magic there is no magic like unfortunately there is no magic people if people are bitching about like oh solar and wind is expensive which mind you at this point in time is cheaper than coal and gas how the heck you're gonna afford nuclear which is already more expensive than coal and gas it's like expensive very expensive idiotically expensive ludicrously expensive is fusion reactors it's like everybody's struggling are we gonna have this it's like no we don't not anytime soon not even close to soon i'm i've watched some nuclear physicists talking about that uh, helium energy thing is like what the hell they were, they were just like instead of like always 30 years away now it's always five years away so there are no such thing as free lunch we have to accept okay option whereas we have to be like okay this is not perfect tool but it is a tool that is less harmful if we deploy today compared to if we do not act so every uh, basically every vector that is there in renewable have it been solved no there are many things unsolved for example wind turbines have this one issue it's like what the hell you do after 25 years we generally have no idea how to recycle these things same goes with solar panel but again that's how exactly it happened with everything back in the days we were making cars nobody even thought about like oh you have to scrap a car after you make it but again we had a basically garbage issue then we solved it same with lead acid battery oh we had to solve it okay we solved it same thing that's how it works like you, you does not need to wait for it's like i'll wait for 5g technology to get into mobile phones and there will not be any 5g technology you have to go into g1 g2 g3 g4 g5 that's how it works but is it more sorted than fossil fuels absolutely by all vectors known data points and gift of putin everybody knows that fossil fuels are not reliable like neither politically neither globally neither even environmental wise also flat out not reliable and comes to the mathematical aspect how doctors operate is like save today so you can bitch tomorrow meaning if you do not act today you will not have a tomorrow you will like oh yeah we cooked the whole ecosystem so we'll no longer have farming abilities and voila we did so we have to make sure like let's up stop co2 emission today only then we can live long enough where we're like okay let's do about co2 sequestration only then we're gonna be like okay fusion can be ready then can be deployed then we'll have enough prosperity to actually deploy those sort of technology right now it's not there so we have to survive today so we can bitch tomorrow this is a very critical aspect survive today so you can bitch tomorrow that's the fact we cannot go around we have to do this so this was my presentation on the myths of uh, basically renewable energies. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you are free. And as always, thanks for watching.